Live from KSAT 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. An investigation into wrongdoing that merely scratched the surface. That's how the attorney for San Antonio police officer Andre Vargas described the probe that led to his client being terminated. Case head investigates Dylan Collier was there for day two of arbitration as the SAPD's use of force practices took center stage. <laughs> After attorneys for the city on Tuesday repeatedly played footage of Officer Andre Vargas's combative encounter with suspect Matthew Garza in a Southside parking lot, attorney Ben C. Fuentes spent Wednesday pulling apart the video and Garza's subsequent statement to internal affairs frame by frame. In the hot seat for the second consecutive day, SAPD Sergeant James Sendejo, whose 2020 investigation of Vargas was his first since being moved into internal affairs. Sergeant Sendejo's testimony was methodical, taking up much of the day, but of critical importance to Vargas's defense, as the officer's attorney was able to poke holes in the internal affairs investigation. You keep on moving your hands. First you're like this, then you're like this, and then... Most notably, that Sendejo didn't thoroughly document Garza's injuries or take statements from first responders who may have treated him at the scene that November 2019 night, and that there was no evidence Garza had been deprived of oxygen. Vargas's expert witness, a licensed pathologist, had a contentious back and forth with the city over whether he has law enforcement use of force expertise. Vargas, a three-year veteran of SAPD at the time of his firing, has asked to receive back pay and to be reinstated. Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. Now, SAPD Chief William McManus was scheduled to testify this morning, but that's been pushed until later this week after an unexplained delay from attorneys for the city. And tonight we have new details in the case of three San Antonio police officers charged in the shooting of Melissa Pettis. The police department confirming today the mental health unit was not called to the scene the morning Pettis was shot. In a news conference that night, Chief William McManus said Pettis was having a mental health crisis. And as our case that investigates found out yesterday, all three officers involved in that shooting had some form of mental health training. All of the officers suspended without pay and police tell us they are currently going through the termination process. All three officers charged with murder. They're currently free on bond. The family of Melissa Pettis releasing a statement today saying, quote, we are horrified by the events that led to the unnecessary death of our mother, Melissa Pettis. We loved her dearly. We are having a difficult, very difficult time processing the events surrounding her death. We hope that our mother's memory can inspire our community to come together and demand the needed changes within SAPD. We ask for your prayers and support during this difficult time, end quote. Imagine this being so desperate to keep your home that you don't even wait for firefighters. In fact, you try to put out a fire at an apartment complex yourself. That is what happened to people at Vista del Rey Apartments in Leon Valley. Now, Leon Valley firefighters did go there. They battled the flames, but neighbors say that it wasn't as easy for them to access the burning building. So instead, they grabbed some fire extinguishers and they tried to put out those flames. Well, the gates are locked for the fire department, all three of them. Like, there's only two ways in and out. So, like, by the time they got here, like, it's already halfway on the building. So right now, 12 units are gone. Those are 12 homes. We visited the Vista del Rey leasing office and called several times. We're still waiting to hear from the property managers. It was all an accident and self-defense. That's what a man on trial for murder says on an interrogation video shown in court today. Michael Phipps accused of the murder of his aunt back in 2019. Erica Hernandez on what the jury saw today. I didn't mean for this to happen. Michael Phipps says those exact words about 10 times during the hour and a half interrogation video shown during his trial. Phipps is accused of fatally shooting his aunt Becky Ivarra on June 4, 2019 in Castle Hills. On that day, Phipps tells the lead investigator that he was afraid of his aunt and that she bullied him and his mother before. She'll push you, uh, she'll put her hands on you. Um, Becky is a large woman. Uh, she takes martial arts. She was taking my, mom, uh, uh, my mom's car uh, against her will. 
the, the social and I went over to help and uh, then she attacked me. He goes on to say that Ibarra then pinned him against a table and that is when he pulled a gun from his pocket. I pulled it out and it got caught in my pocket. She continued to push me against the table and then the gun went off. Fip says he never pointed the gun at Ibarra and that this was all in self-defense. I felt like I was defending myself. I was defending my mom. So what happens next in this trial? Well, the jury will be back tomorrow and could begin deliberations. If they come up with a guilty verdict, Phipps faces up to life in prison. At the Kidna Reeves Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Tonight, a man's recovering after a crash on the northwest side. It happened around 1.30 this morning in the 9100 block of Loop 1604 West. That's near the town of Holotus. San Antonio police say the driver just lost control of his vehicle. Officers say the SUV then rolled over, which trapped him inside. Fire crews rescued that man, and he was taken to a nearby hospital. And at last check, he was in critical condition. No other vehicles were involved. Now, people living on the west side are worried. They say that VIA's new housing development could hurt them and the other people who actually rely on VIA buses in order to get around. The, plug, the Public Transportation Service says that it's going to turn the old SCOBY building near downtown into affordable apartments with some retail and office space. Our Camilla Juarez spoke with people who are against that plan. People who work downtown, they're the housekeepers, um, they're the teachers, they're the mechanics, you know. Leticia Sanchez is a daily via bus rider and lifelong West Sider. Those people, you know, won't be able to benefit from this project as it currently is. Via is proposing to offer a mix of market rate and below market rate rents. At least half of the units will be affordable for a family of four, making between 50 to 66,000 a year. However, the average household income in the 78207 zip code earns less than $26,000. The average VIA bus rider earns less than $25,000 a year. We take the bus because we can't afford a car. So if we can't afford to buy a car, what makes them think that we're going to be able to afford the apart the rent at the at the proposed uh, rates that they have right now people who live in the area say they're not against developing this building but what they are saying is that developers using taxpayer dollars need to build something that benefits the community we're in a food desert so a grocery would be great uh, but a grocery that caters to our people's needs. VIA held an open house event in May, but it was canceled. Another meeting was supposed to be rescheduled in June. VIA is not listening. If they are doing surveys, we have not heard about any of these surveys. The survey that they have for this SCOBY project is online. A lot of our people don't even have access to the internet. We reached out to VIA through phone and we are still waiting to hear back. Camila Juarez, case at 12 News. Go outside right now, take a look at I-10 and you can see, remember the cloud cover that we had this last week? Out of the nothing big but, clouds, nothing they're but, gone. Yeah. Yeah, that heat high is directly overhead and so it's really preventing any clouds during the afternoon and other than the early morning do we get those low clouds for a few hours otherwise it's sunny that's going to change though as our whole weather pattern starts to shift here uh, really starting tomorrow and we'll start to notice more of a shift 102 our high today that's one degree shy of the record the average high is 93 i do want to point out del rio as we've been talking del rio has been breaking high temperatures daily now for 11 days in a row now today they did tie the record they didn't break it they tied the record high making it to 108 in del rio as we go through the evening hours clear sky warm you'll notice that stickiness increasing again later on tonight southeasterly wind at 10 to 15 by 10 o'clock we're at 90 degrees midnight 82 we'll be back in a little bit to talk about the downward trend in temperatures as rain chances come back into the picture in just a bit. Oh, looking forward to that, Adam. Thank you. Now we're going to take a live look outside right now and talk about traffic. Yeah, that's I-35 North at Loop 410. You know what you see there? Nothing. Not a lot of traffic, which is nice. It's what we want to see at 608 here on Wednesday. In other news now, Texas lawmakers are going to take another swing at property taxes. And Governor Greg Abbott has called the legislature back to Austin for a second special session. Our Sarah Costa gives us a look at what's on the agenda this time around. 
The House lawmakers returned this morning the first 30 day special session of 2023 for the Texas Senate ended quietly Tuesday with no laws made and the Texas House and Senate still deadlocked on the best approach to property tax cuts. The Texas House has been adjourned since May 30th. The House passed bills on property taxes and border security then left. The Senate passed its own versions, but without the House in session, nothing made it to the governor's desk. Governor Greg Abbott held firm on asking lawmakers to provide relief through a method known as compression or sending state funds to school districts to help them lower their property tax rates. Abbott supports the House's property tax plan, which has since put him at odds with Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick. The House version would send more money to school districts to lower property taxes. Compared to the Senate version, which would focus more of the money set aside for property taxes on increasing the homestead exemption. Abbott says he will call additional special sessions on property taxes until a deal reaches his desk. In a statement, the governor said, quote, unless and until the House and Senate agree on a different proposal to provide property tax cuts, I will continue to call for lasting property tax cuts through rate reductions and working toward eliminating the school property tax in Texas, end quote. The governor also recently vetoed a number of bills from the regular session, citing the importance of passing legislation on property taxes first. I'm Sarah Costa, KSAT 12 News. And we want you to stick around because after the break, the Transportation Safety Administration wants to tell you something before the holiday weekend. It's about travel. It's after the break. Now, here's what we're working on for you tonight on the night beat. Yes, for many of us, it is too hot to go out to eat. Restaurant owners say that the extreme heat is hurting their bottom line. The message that they want customers to hear tonight on the night beat. Heat related illnesses are the reality this time of year, but certain groups aren't getting the help they need when they need it. What's being done to break this statistic? Those stories and more tonight on the night beat. All right, so the 4th of July weekend is looking to be a busy time at the airport and the TSA wants to make that easier on you. So it has some advice for you. If you're traveling in the country, show up at least two hours before your flight three hours before if you're flying internationally. Also, if you have questions about prohibited items, TSA wants you to ask them on social media or through an agent at the airport. Some airlines, by the way, do let you travel with pets, but first, make sure that you clear that with your airline before the trip. Going to an airport can be a scary place. It can be uncomfortable, pets can get stressed, and one of the ways to help them with that stress is to kind of give them a sense of home. Now, bringing toys or things that pets are familiar with will help keep them calm as they travel with you to your destination. So that's just another tip. All right. Have you ever heard of the term sploot? Now you have. According to the Texas <laughs> Parks and Wildlife Department, animals sploot to try and make as much body contact as possible with something to stay cool. I thought that was called planking, but apparently it's called splooting. Okay. In photos posted to our KSAT Connect, squirrels around the area were seen lying on patios and in dirt, even on fences. One viewer posted that a squirrel dug a hole as a way to try and beat the heat. Interesting. Maybe we can learn something from them. But splooting, yeah, got it. Teach old dogs a new sploot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. We're going to. You know who's been fascinated by he this? Loves that term. I love he saying splooting. I know. Sploot. I know you Sploot. do. Every oh, yeah. time I said it, it was like you were like ready, ready. I couldn't help saying it on the newsroom today. We're going to do some splooting. We're going to show some splooting. It's too yeah. bad it doesn't sound like what it is. Just saying. <laughs> yes. Hey, I've got some more splooting here for you. Check this out. This one just came in on our KSAC Connect. Come pass this one up. A tandem sploot going on under the awning. Some squirrels keeping cool there. It's good to see. I've synchronized. Synchronized splooting. Oh, that's good. <laughs> synchronized splooting. We're all over. We've got it all for you. Yeah, and it's fun to go through these photos on KSAT Connect online or on your mobile device, and you can see all the various photos. And yeah, I see the squirrels do that on my back deck and on the oak tree as well. And I was listening to NPR earlier, and they were also uh, saying that, you know, other animals do it as well. Bears will even do that sometimes in the summertime if they get too hot. Anyway, 
100 degrees for the high temperature the next three days. So we're actually seeing a little downward trend in our highs. Still splooting temperatures if you ask me, but we will knock off even more degrees into next week. Mid 90s for high temperatures by Monday. So a noticeable change on the way. Here's the overall pattern. Let's talk about what's going to cause these changes and what it means for our rain chances. Upper level ridge, the heat high, it's still planted directly overhead. So all the active weather is up and around it, not under it. And also this is pressing down on us, so that's why we have some of the hottest temperatures in the nation right now. Temperatures around and above 100 underneath the heat high. San Angelo 106, 100 even right now in San Antonio here. Lubbock at 103, even Wichita 102. It's warmer here in San Antonio than it is in Las Vegas. Las Vegas now 97. They actually have that trough, the dip in the upper level flow. But the heat high moves eastward and it breaks down quite a bit. This is going to open the door for a very subtle upper level swirl over Texas and just less pressure from the heat high. So temperatures will take a drop and it opens the door for rain chances. Don't expect anything widespread. And here's the model generalization of where we have the best rain chances over the next seven days. And the darker green indicate where you could actually have some decent accumulations. Notice that's not necessarily near us, at least not yet, but it's closer to us. And I do think we have the potential of some of those isolated or widely separated afternoon and early evening showers and storms to pop up starting on Sunday, but more so Monday of next week and then all the way through at least the middle part of the week. Don't get too excited. 10% chance Sunday, and right now we have it at a 20% chance Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. But that's better than anything we've had over the past week or so. So it's good to see some of those uh, afternoon and evening showers and storm chances returning. It's some hope, so cross your fingers for your neighborhood. Coverage will be limited, though. Let's talk temperatures. 103 Castroville, 100 in New Braunfels, 97 Bulverde, 101 Hondo, Del Rio 107 along with Catula. Now the dew points in the afternoons are finally dropping off. We're seeing those dew points drop off. So let's compare these temperatures to the feels like, the heat index. Catula feels like 110, so still tacking on a few degrees, but Del Rio, the heat index, when you calculate it with their drier air, actually drops below the air temperature. So we're starting to see that trend with the dew points dropping in the afternoon. Here in San Antonio, feels like three degrees warmer than the air temperature. Tomorrow morning, 77, partly cl cloudy briefly, then sunny most of the day, making it to 100 for the high temperature, feeling like it's up to 104, I think, during the hottest part of the day. Carrizo Springs tomorrow 104, Del Rio 102. Downward trend considering Del Rio was 110 not that long ago. So temperatures are definitely slowly starting that downward trend. Converse tomorrow 99 and Helotus 96. A lot of sunshine until we get into the weekend and next week actually we'll have some variety to our sky with some mid and upper clouds along with those slight rain chances. So some changes are on the horizon. Hey, next at uh, 645, look at African dust when it could get near us and an update on the tropics. It's still sploot weather. No, oh, definitely. It's, weather. <laughs> yeah. it's always sploot weather. This is going to be right that in the KSAT dictionary. It's, it's, it's just going to yeah. be a thing. All right. We've been having a discussion about this for the longest time when it comes to Wemby. What mm -hmm. is his actual height? It's varied anywhere from seven foot two to seven foot five or six. Yeah. So he told us a handful of months ago that he's seven three without shoes on. With shoes, of course, he's taller. Well, the Spurs released Wimby's official height today. And being that he's 19, you expect he's probably a little taller, right? Well, he is. Young man is still growing. Plus, Jordan Westberg living out his major league dream, and his former high school coach is loving it. Coming up. The Spurs 19-year-old rookie Victor Wimanyama will not play in Sacramento at the California Classic. He will unite with the team a few days later in Las Vegas, where he'll make his summer league debut. Wimby will join the summer league Spurs for two days of practice tomorrow and Friday here in town before the rest of the team leaves for Sacramento on July 1st. And as for Wimby's new height, the Spurs listed him as seven foot three and a half inches, so he's grown a bit per the Associated Press. He was measured without shoes per NBA guidelines. Spurs players Charles Bassey and Blake Wesley celebrated a 
court renovation with a basketball clinic for local youth this morning. Spurs Give, the City of San Antonio Parks and Recreation Department, and the San Antonio Retail Merchants Association helped to open a renovated Spurs themed outdoor basketball court at Rainbow Hills Park. I mean, it feels great. You know, I remember as a kid growing up, you know, I never played in a, in a gym like this, in an outdoor gym, you know, play without shoes and stuff. So just seeing the kids, uh, the sports giving back to the kids and we as a team are showing up and just helping these kids, you know, realize their dreams and stuff. It's, it's great. I love it. We can get lost really quickly in all the busynesses of things that are happening, the new and exciting players that we've got on the team. And if we pause long enough to remember, like, the stuff that matters most, the stuff that ensures that community knows that we're going to keep showing up, no matter who's on the court, is the stuff like this, right? And so that we can take a pause out of a really hot summer day and take some time in the morning to play ball with young people, like, that's the dream. This marks the 13th place space renovation completed through the Play SA project. Former New Braunfels High School star athlete Jordan Westberg made his major league debut Monday night at Oriole Park at Camden Yards against the Cincinnati Reds. His first at bat came in the rain and he drew a walk. He was down 0-2 in his first big league plate appearance and he was patient enough to earn a trip to first base. His parents and his wife Anna Claire were there for this big moment. Of course, batting seventh, he went one for four, scoring a run, driving in another. Here's Jordan Monday before making his big league debut. I'm looking forward to it. I'm really cherishing this opportunity. Going to try to soak it all in and uh, at the same time trying to contribute any way I can to help this team win. To get the call while they're at home and then play your first big league game in Camden Yards, what does that mean? It's special, uh, super special. I've only been here a handful of times, obviously never to play here. So I'm really, really looking forward to it. Um, I've heard a lot about the crowds and the, the atmosphere and environment, so I'm looking forward to it. Westberg came up with his first major league hit in the bottom of the fifth right there, a moment he will never forget. And that's a base hit and a ball game that his baseball coach at New Braunfels High School, Bobby Alford, will always cherish. Unbelievable. So I was with my family in New Braunfels and we were watching the game and, and we got to see some of the clips before when they were doing like uh, they showed him at the pregame. You know, he got to the stadium, he had his phone out, he was kind of taking it all in. Uh, not a big expression. You can tell how fired up he was and excited he was because he's just he's just a professional guy. He's always been uh, never too high or never too low, just kind of right in the middle. And But you could tell how excited he was. Had his phone out looking at it. They showed him in front of his locker. Uh, I got to see the clip of the day before when the manager told him he was going to the big leagues and you can see him crack a little bit of a smile but he was just like yes sir and they gave him a hug and here we are. Westberg will make his third straight start tonight and the Orioles are still playing the Reds. How exciting. For him. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I, get, I, get I just goosebumps. love highlighting all the talent that we have in South Texas. And we have a lot. Yes we do. We do. Thank Thanks, you. Lauren. We'll be right back. Welcome back. She is one of San Antonio's newest city council members. Dr. Sue Kaur represents District 1. And she joins us live in the studio to answer many of your questions and, of course, our questions about what she wants to do for the city of San Antonio and, of course, District 1. Okay, well, you talk about District 1. One of the biggest issues facing that district that we've been hearing about for a long time is construction. The St. Mary Strip, a lot of business owners say that they have been hurt by delays in construction. How are you going to help them? How can you help them, I should say? So first and foremost, we are the first line of defense, the first elect, the closest elected official to residents. And so we want to be there over communicating to residents, telling them what's happening and also holding our contractors and our city staff accountable for the work that's happening. And so the way we're going about doing this is prioritizing infrastructure in our office. On the campaign trail, I had said we were going to hire an infrastructure director and we are actually on the way to hiring two people with that same background because I'm not an engineer engineer by trade, but having someone that understands why the decisions are being made in the way that they are. And then also asking tough questions of the work that's happening is a few of the things that we've already started doing to let people know what's going on. Obviously, you have a different perspective now that you're actually on the city council instead of a candidate. What have you learned about why those delays took place on St. Yeah. Mary's and 
hopefully what lessons were learned in all that. Yeah, so I think the first few lessons that we've learned is sometimes things, ha when you get start digging, you don't really know what's underground. Yeah. And that's because we have infrastructure that's incredibly old that hasn't been addressed. And so things start to pile up. And uh, it, when they start digging, they didn't always know what was going on. And so uh, unfortunately, that means that we are taking a long time to get something done. I also think we can do a better job and be more diligent about contractors that we hire, about making sure we have enough funds set aside for specific projects. And at the end of the day, I think what we've really lacked on is communication and community engagement. And that's what our office can do and what we commit to doing in, in, as we continue through all the other infrastructure projects that are that are on. Because what's great news for constituents, if you're listening in, is that St. Mary's is predicted to be done by the end of July, beginning of August. Wow. It's just something that they've heard a lot, a lot yes. about. A lot, a lot of delay, <laughs> yes. So I don't think they're getting too uh, excited, excited about we, that. Yeah, whenever they hear a new update. There's a big difference between being a candidate and you were just talking about this when you're with the constituents and you're hearing about what they need okay well now you got the job and so there's a big difference between because now you actually you have to compromise you have to work with your colleagues and things look different on this side so can you talk about that yeah, when you're at the doors, all you're hearing is what constituents are facing on a daily basis, the challenges. And with, with the passionate heart that I have, I just want to come in and address all of those challenges. And then you realize when you get into the seat that, okay, there are reasons why things are happening, but that doesn't mean that the work can't be done. And so it's about how we do the work, not no. And, and we always say that in, in our office. And so I think the biggest difference is one, we have to learn both sides of an issue. We have to take the time necessary sometimes to understand why certain decisions are being made, communicating and closing the feedback loop, because that's also something that we've noticed is that constituents will share their thoughts and feedback, but they never get a response. And so we will make sure that we do that so that when we're making a decision with in hand in hand with the community and with the city, that it's what's best for everyone. Do you when you took decided to run? It was kind of at a nexus of where there was construction problems on St. Mary's. There were uh, noise ordinance complaints between the businesses in District 1 and some of the neighborhood associations in District 1. What was the one thing that you said, all right, I need to get in this race? The one thing that actually is my why is around the economic segregation that exists in the city. So infrastructure is a major challenge. And actually, all of these issues that city council deals with affect our schools, affect our kids and our future generation. But as a public educator by trade, I've been in the education system for 15 years. We too often see that our schools that are the most under have the most underserved populations are the ones with the biggest infrastructure challenges, that the areas surrounding those underserved communities are the the ones that have the most drainage issues, the least access to health care, um, access to healthy food. The digital divide is a perfect example of some of the things that we see that are hugely separating between the communities in, our, in, in District 1. And it's very evident in District 1. You can walk four blocks and feel like you're in two completely places. Um, and so that's why I actually got into the race, to be able to be a voice for those and to help advocate for all of our communities, regardless of the zip code that you live in. And I'm sure you also spoke with constituents about issues that they may have or questions that they may have about uh, their community and police relations. And that brings us into the uh, tragic story of uh, Melissa Bettis, um, the woman who was shot and killed by SAPD um, just a few days ago. We've been asking our candidates when they come on our panel to to just give us their thoughts or, or anything on that. Can you talk to us about that? Just yeah. give us your thoughts. Firstly, my heart goes out to the family of the Perezes. It, no one should have to suffer or die the way that she did. I think it was a tragic situation, one that takes a, a, take, charges us at city leadership and at SAPD leadership to take a step back and reflect on how this situation could have happened. But it also really highlights mental health issues in our community. Mental health is something I don't think we talk enough about and we don't have enough supports for. So regardless of who it is, we need to uh, make sure we're doubling down this budget cycle on how we can help. And we did just uh, allocate more ARPA funds for mental health issues with opportunity youth and at-risk youth in this last uh, city council vote, but it really does highlight the work that still is yet to be done and what was making sure that we prevent this situation like this from ever happening again. We've done some stories since then at KSAT, and, and one of our investigate story yesterday was with a former member of the mental health unit who said they don't take calls 24 hours a day, that there were only 12 of them. And then we found out today that the mental health unit wasn't even called mm -hmm. in this particular instance. Does this include conversations with 
police officers and SAPD in this whole thing when you talk about mental health? Absolutely. And so even when you call 911, there should be an option for you to be able to say someone needs mental health supports. I think we, we already know this pilot program has been successful with the mental health unit at SAPD. So we need to think about how we can double down on those resources. All right, final question for you. you I have noticed, and this is, I, I like to end with a lighter question here. <laughs> I have noticed you have a companion with you yes. on most of your campaign stops and most of the speeches that you get. You have a little dog. I want you to talk a little bit more about this person that you have, kind of usually like literally on your hip. Literally on my hip. And she would be here today if I okay. could. Um, so her name is Hira. She's a little Pomeranian poodle. And I actually got her during Snowvid when that crazy snowstorm yes. off Craigslist and got her in a Walmart parking lot, believe it or not. And I am a big believer that it, all of us need emotional support in some way or the other. And just like you have family, she is my family. And so that's why she goes with me everywhere. And, and I encourage, and this is another reason why we really want to make sure we're advocating for ACS services, because our dogs are our families and anyone who is a true dog lover will know that and um and so she's my family she's cool. going to be with you during the council meetings i you know i have said i we, she will be at city hall so she's okay. been allowed to be in my she'll office be around. she'll be in my office looking from afar sending me good vibes telling me go. how to vote well, and if i had any question if you were a dog lover or not when i asked that question about your dog i could see your eyes light up so i'm glad we brought i'm glad we brought her up i'd like to end with you know we were as uh, i was at centro this morning and listening to matt brown's speech going away and he talked about love and compassion and if this world had more love and compassion we'd be a much better place so i hope to bring that to council and Hida will too yeah dr love, Super. Love your time. thank you so much for being with us today thank you thank, thank you. you we'll be right back